So very good morning to you all. Hope you all are doing well and preparing well for your exams. Today we are going to discuss a very important topic uh, in clinical practice as well as uh, in the exams, uh, pituitary MRI interpretation. Again, uh, thank you very much for all the support you have shown to me and my channel. And uh, I will try my best to keep on sharing as much of information as I can. So let's start right away with the presentation. All right, so today's topic is about pituitary MRI interpretation. So <clears throat> let's start by looking at the normal MRI pituitary. I mean, a uh, normal uh, scan in terms of the T1 and the T2 images. Now, T1, here we can see in this actual image that the CSF appears as dark, okay? So all the CSF appearing here is dark, as I can you can see by the cursor. In terms of the T2 image, the most important is that the CSF appears as bright. So all the CSF is appearing as bright. The other thing which is important, which you should look at, is the white matter. The white matter is light in color in the T1 weighted images, and the white matter is dark gray in the T2 images. This is the axial view, okay? Let's look at the comparison of T1 versus uh, T1 with gadolinium. So the same T1 in which the uh, CSF is appearing dark, as you can see the CSF is appearing dark, when there is a contrast given like gadolinium, you can clearly see the contrast appearing in these spaces here. So this helps us know between the contrast image and a non-contrast image, okay? So clearly we can see that there is a increased gadolinium enhanced signal in the blood vessels in a contrast image, okay? Now this is more as we see in our exams, so this is a T1 versus a T2 sagittal image uh, for, for the brain. And here we can see that again in the T1, the CSF is appearing as black. And in the T2 image here, the CSF is appearing as bright, so like whitish. The pituitary gland can be seen here. As you can see, the normal pituitary gland is appearing here in the cella tersica. And here again, you can see the normal pituitary gland in the cellar tersica in the T2 weighted image. But clearly see the difference how a T1 looks like and how a T2 image looks like. So these are sagittal views. Now let's look at the normal pituitary in detail here. So here, what we are seeing again, see the CSF here is appearing as black again. So this is a T1 weighted image. So it's a sagittal view, what I'm showing here, okay? Now this shows, uh, as the normal anatomy of the pituitary gland. So let's look at the normal anatomy first. So here you can see A marked as is the anterior pituitary tissue. The P is the posterior pituitary. In fact, if you can see the P is a little bit bright. So this is called the posterior pituitary bright spot. And many a times in conditions like diabetes insipidus, there is a loss of this posterior pituitary bright spot. If you can see what I have marked by the arrow here is the pituitary stock. On top of that, you can see the chiasm, optic chiasm. M is the mammillary body. B is the brainstem. And the other important structure here is the spinoid sinus, which is marked S. Okay. So this is the main anatomy of the pituitary gland, which we should know of when we are going to interpret the pathology involved in it. Let's move on to the Next one. Again, here what I'm showing is a again a T1. Why? Because the CSF is dark, as you can see. But this is a coronal image. So that was a sagittal image. This is a coronal image. Again, we can see the anterior pituitary here marked as A. The posterior pituitary again visible as a bright spot. So a little bit bright, a little bit whitish. We can see the pituitary stock right in the middle, and we can again see the optic chiasm. And another important structure here we are seeing is the clevis CL. And as you can see here, there is a artery, which we are seeing here. These are basically the carotid arteries, okay? So the cavernous segments of the carotid arteries marked as I, 
This is seen within the cavernous sinus. I have shown you another picture now in the next slide where we can see the cavernous sinus more clearly. But this is the border of the cavernous sinus, and these are the carotid arteries within that. So basically, more anatomy here we are seeing in the coronal image. So here I have marked for you the sphenoid sinus. You can see the black one, which we saw in the other image as well. This is the pituitary gland marked here. Okay. Then there is the pituitary stalk, also referred to as infundibulum. Then you have the optic chiasm on the top. I told you the carotid arteries and surrounding the carotid arteries inside. I mean, the carotid arteries lie within the cavernous sinus. So both these yellow borders here are the cavernous sinus. Here we can see carotid arteries on both sides, cavernous sinus, pituitary gland right in the center, infundibulum or the pituitary stalk in the middle, and the optic chiasma on top of it. Again, this is a coronal plane image. Now, this is how it will look at, I look as in the enhanced image. So if you see, this is a sagittal T1 weighted image, which is an enhanced image. So this is after gadolinium. So you can clearly see that the pituitary gland is fully enhanced as well as the pituitary stalk. So this is a normal enhancement of the pituitary gland after contrast. So let's start with the cases now. We have a 30 year old woman who was presented to the OPD with a six month history of amenorrhea. She had had one successful pregnancy in the past and was otherwise well. And now she's having difficulty conceiving. On examination, she has an upper outer quadrantopia. So here we have a lady who is trying to conceive, has one previous successful pregnancy, uh, has a history of six months of amenorrhea, but still not pregnant. So there is definitely something going on in terms of the hormones. And she has a visual field defect. She has an upper outer quadrantopia. On investigations, the relevant investigation, which is high, is the prolactin, which is around 9,000. The other uh, hormones look fine, FSHLH, the sodium potassium electrolytes look appear normal. And this is the MRI image, uh, what we can see for this patient. Now, I'll describe it right away, but uh, have a look at it and see and guess what it is. Okay, so again, first try and uh, analyze the image itself. So again, it is a T1 weighted image. Why? Because we can clearly see the uh, CSF is black. Okay, I'll describe this image for you more after I see the answer. Okay. Here you can see clearly there is a mass which is arising from the region of the cella. So it's basically expanding the cella and it is also extending into the sphenoid sinus. And we can also see it can ex it is extending up to the supracellar region and even abetting the optic chiasm. So these are all the things which we are looking at in this image. Now we'll see the exact description in the coming slides, but based on this, what is the most appropriate management in this patient? Okay, so basically we are talking about a high prolactin with this macroadenoma. Okay, so what is the most appropriate management of this patient? Yeah, I am sure you are going to guess the answer right by now. Dopamine agonist therapy. So dopamine agonist therapy is the first line treatment for macroprolactinoma, and in this particular scenario of this patient, this patient is wanting to become pregnant. So the medication which we should prefer to start for her as per the guidelines is bromocriptin, especially if she's planning for pregnancy as this case. Now I'm describing this more in detail now, as you can see, as I told you, it is a T1 sagittal image, okay? What we can clearly see that the cella has expanded. I mean, the T1 is arising from the cella and is expanding the cella and is extending into the sphenoid sinus, okay? So the green arrow shows the cell is enlarged. We can also see by the blue arrow a little bit of wasting. So this is what we call wasting in the center. This is very typical of a macroadenoma. And also very typical of a lesion which is arising from cella and then extending into the supracell region. Okay, so that is important. And the red arrow here, which we can see, is the optic chiasm getting compressed or stretched. And S is the spinoid sinus, of course. So clearly this is a pituitary macroadenoma, which is secreting hyperlactin, which we'll refer to as macroprolactinoma. And because this lady is trying to conceive, bromocryptin will be the drug of choice in this case. So what are the specific uh, guidelines in this regard? So I'm covering some high yield points as well here. So of course, the 
patient will be started initially on bromocriptyl in this case, but they should be instructed to discontinue dopamine agonist therapy as soon as they discover that they are pregnant. Now, this is through if this is a microprolactinoma or a macroprolactinoma. Now, in selected patients with macroadenomas who become pregnant on dopamine agonist therapy and who have not had any prior surgical or radiation therapy to try and shrink the tumor, it may be prudent to continue dopamine uh, agonist therapy throughout pregnancy, especially if the tumor is invasive or is abetting the optic chasm. So if the tumor is invading the cavernous sinus, abetting the optic chasm, causing field effects, we have to continue the dopamine agonist therapy most likely in throughout the pregnancy. So these are the recommendations with the endocrine society guidelines. In pregnant patients with prolactinoma, of course, there is no use of measuring prolactin during pregnancy. We recommend against routine use of doing MRI in patients with microadenoma or intracellular microadenoma unless there is a clinical evidence of tumor growth. For example, if there is a visual field defect arising or visual field compromise arising, then that could be an indication to do an pituitary MRI. But doing a routine pituitary MRI is not recommended by the endocrine society guidelines during pregnancy. What are the other things which is important is that uh, uh, when we start the patients on bromocriptin, what is also mentioned in the guidelines, if the patient cannot tolerate bromocriptin or if adequate tumor shrinkage is not achieved with bromocriptin, then cabergulin should be uh, given in this case scenario. So again, this is an important part from the endocrine society guidelines. Again, they recommend doing a formal visual field assessment followed by MRI without uh, gadolinium in pregnant women with prolactinomas who experience severe headache and visual field effect. So for example, this same lady of ours, she has become pregnant and uh, when she becomes pregnant, we have stopped her medication. In that case scenario, if she then develops any headaches or any visual field uh, compromise, the first step will be a visual field assessment and this should be followed up with an MRI, but in this case, without gadolinium in a pregnant woman. So again, these are specific recommendations from the guidelines. Again, uh, bromocriptin is preferred, as I mentioned. Uh, if the to uh, adenoma does not respond or uh, patient is intolerant, then we need to use cabergoline. Again, if cabergoline is not successful in elevating the severely compromised vision after several weeks, then it is recommended as per the guidelines to do a surgery specifically in the second trimester. So the indication in that case will be in the second trimester to do a transpinal surgery. Now, what is also mentioned is in contrast in the third trimester, if the patient has persistent visual symptoms, then the uh, guidelines recommend to defer the surgery after the delivery if possible, okay? So these are all the high yield points for this case, especially uh, when we're dealing with a macro prolactinoma in pregnancy, and there are specific guidelines by the endocrine society, which I have mentioned and covered here by this high yield points. Okay, now I'm just showing you another example of another macro adenoma here, uh, a separate case. Uh, again, here we have a coronal T1 weighted image, which is unenhanced, so there is no contrast. Again, here I can see, we can see that the cella is enlarged. There is clearly a macro adenoma, which is extending up into the supracellar area, and the optic chasm is stretched, as you can see here by this graph. So this is another uh, image of a macro adenoma. I put another image here. This is an enhanced image. So you can see this is a coronal image, but you can clearly see that there is some enhancement happening. So it's after a dye. Here we can see that the there is a heterogeneous diffuse enhancement of the macroadenoma. And we can see the optic chasm on the top here. This we can make it more clearly in an enhanced, make out more clearly in an enhanced image because the optic chasm usually will not enhance when a uh, contrast has been given. So this again, we can see a mass which is arising from the cella, extending into the supracellar area and compressing the optic chasm. So another image of a pituitary macroadenoma. Let's move on to case number two. Here we have a 40 year old man who has been referred to the endocrine clinic with symptoms of recurrent headache. So the free view of this particular lecture has ended. Uh, for access to this full lecture session, please subscribe to my lecture series which is total of 60 lectures till date. Uh, these uh, will be provided access to via paid subscription plan. And uh, all the paid subscribers will be given a lifetime access to all my existing 60 videos lectures, which are already on the YouTube channel. 
plus all the upcoming new videos. So whatever lectures or sessions I'll be doing in coming weeks, months, and years, all of them will be uh, given access to in the same subscription plan. So for the full subscription details, please email me on mazirules at gmail.com or WhatsApp me on 0097155743 and have the same number on the Telegram app as well. Uh, just to give a brief overview of the full lecture series, so it includes uh, different topics across diabetes and endocrinology. So diabetes itself is there are around 19 lectures which I've done across different topics which are useful for the exams as well as for the clinical endocrinology practice. In terms of uh, high yield topics for specialty exam and European board exam, there are around nine sessions which have covered all the previous exam recalls as well as all the high yield topics and themes which are frequently encountered in the uh, specialty exams and the European board exams. In terms of thyroid, apart from the thyroid cancer guidelines which were recently uh, published, plus there are other sessions on different topics uh, related to thyroid uh, across the spectrum of thyroid disease. In terms of adrenal as well, covering all the important topics or sessions which are frequently encountered in exams and in clinical practice. There are two very good sessions on lab endocrinology by Dr. Well Murugan, very helpful for those preparing for uh, DM endo or DNB endocrinology as well. In terms of pituitary also have covered all the important sessions on all the important topics which are frequently encountered in clinical practice and the exams. There are a few sessions on the inherited endocrine syndromes as well. Very important sessions on reproductive endocrinology about uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, gynecomastia, hirsutism, PCOS, diagnosis, evaluation, management. There is a uh, sessions on calcium and bone metabolism, on familial lipid disorders, and uh, sessions on pediatric endocrinology as well. So just to let you know that there are many more sessions coming up, and as I mentioned, that in the same subscription plan or same subscription fee, you will be provided access to all my existing 60 lectures plus all my forthcoming lectures. So thank you very much for subscribing. Thank you very much for supporting.